We're going to be looking at John 1, verses 35 through 51. So you could turn there. We'll be reading through that passage in a moment. Who you follow makes a big difference in your life. Uh, there was a lady named Blanche Caffier who passed away in 2006. She had just turned 100. And uh, so she had lived a long and fruitful life. But there is a man who was writing in her memory of how he had interacted with her at the age of nine. She was his school librarian, and he wrote this about her. He said, when I first met Mrs. Caffier, she was the elegant and engaging school librarian at Seattle's View Ridge Elementary, and I was a timid fourth grader. I was desperately trying to go unnoticed because I had some big deficits, like atrocious handwriting, experts now call it dysgraphia, and a comically messy desk. And I was trying to hide the fact that I liked to read, something that was cool for girls but not for boys. Mrs. Caffier took me under her wing and helped make it okay for me to be a messy, nerdy boy who was reading lots of books. She pulled me out of my shell by sharing her love of books. She started by asking questions like, what do you like to read and what are you interested in? Then she found me a lot of books, ones that were more complex and challenging than the Tom Swift Jr. science fiction books I was reading at the time. For example, she gave me great biographies she had read. Once I'd read them, she would make the time to discuss them with me. Did you like it, she would ask? Why, what did you learn? She genuinely listened to what I had to say. Through those book conversations in the library and in the classroom, we became good friends. He goes on to describe her as one of the most influential ladies in his life. This was written by Bill Gates. Many of you may know him as a very successful uh, businessman in the tech world, and he's gone on to a life of philanthropy for different, uh, different um, movements and helping out different causes. But we would look at his life and say, of course, that it's not necessarily uh, has spiritual value. I'm not really sure of his status, uh, although I'm pretty sure that he doesn't uh, follow Christianity or follow Christ. But as far as the world goes, people would look at him and say, this is a very successful man. And this lady, a librarian, when he was the age of nine, helped him a lot in making progress in learning about important things like reading biographies and other people's lives. And as he followed the direction that she set for him, the books that he told her to read, he became very successful by worldly standards. And if we think about that in the spiritual realm, the person or the people that we follow sets a very important precedent for the direction of our lives. And as you can see on the screen, I believe our text tonight points us to the fact that we ought to follow Jesus. He ought to be our primary object and focus, the person that we are focused on and following. And you may say, well, that's really simple. Of course I know that. And yes, that's true. We know we're supposed to follow Jesus, but what does that look like, and how are we to do that? I think John answers that question for us. And so as you read through this text tonight, look for the ways that Jesus directs his followers, how he calls them to follow him, what he calls them to do. And I think tonight as we look at this passage, we can see the path that we ought to follow on, not to, to end up being billionaires in this world, and being able to help different causes, but something much greater, being significant in God's eyes, following God and allowing him to lead the direction of our lives. So as we read this passage, look for how Jesus calls those to follow him that are going to be his disciples as we read through the rest of the book of John. John writes in verse 35, The next day again, John was standing, this is John the Baptist, with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. We know earlier we saw that phrase come up, that John had referenced Jesus as the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. 
One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, as we read through this passage, and perhaps you see the title in your Bible, it says, Jesus calls the first disciples. Your first thought might be, I remember a slightly different story about how Jesus called these disciples. What, what does that story look like? Well, uh, probably in Sunday school, you heard of Jesus calling Peter to get the boat for him and to uh, set it out in the water so that he could speak, perhaps, You've heard the story of Jesus telling uh, Peter to go out and fish again and get more fish. And you might say, well, this seems like a different story. What's going on here? Well, as you read through the different Gospels talking about Jesus calling the disciples, the three first one, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are very similar. Uh, There's additional details in some of them. But this story is very unique, and there's not really a way to put the stories together uh, that would fit, that would allow for all of the details in each of them to still fit. And so as we, of course, take God's word to be completely true, there must be another explanation for what's going on here. And I think as I read through the different explanations of, of putting together these stories, the best way to understand this story is that it came chronologically first. Before Jesus came and called Peter and James and John and the others, to follow him, to be with him on an ongoing basis as his disciples, John the Baptist was connected in pointing those disciples to Jesus, and they followed him briefly, not necessarily as a commitment for the rest of their lives uh, to be his disciples, but they were interested and they recognized there was something different about him. And then what we have the account in the Synoptic Gospels later on is the account of when Jesus said, okay, now you're going to follow me for the rest of your life. And a key phrase that we see in the other Gospels is they left everything and they followed Jesus. And so it seems very clear as we put these different stories together that they're all accurate, they're all historically true, but this story is a pre-story to what happens in the other Gospels when Jesus calls those disciples to stay with him as he goes throughout his ministry uh, on earth here before the cross. And so with that in mind, as we talk about what's going on here, there's a few things that we'll understand perhaps a little differently without context. But I wanted to point that out because there's no conflict in Scripture. There's no disagreement between the passages. It's just that there is different information that's being different, given, different parts of the historical account. And John, I think, has a particular reason for giving us this story in this way to help us understand part of what it means to follow Jesus and the difference that's going on here. So Jesus is calling his his followers in this first section of this passage to abide with him. Look at what happens here. In these first few verses, Jesus wants them to be in his presence. Look at his reaction to them. So John, the Baptist here, is preaching as he's been told to do by God. He's been commissioned to point people to Jesus, and he does this. He's standing with two of his disciples, and Jesus walks by, and he says, Here is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. And so we have two disciples here that heard him say this. These are disciples of John the Baptist at this point, not yet disciples of Christ. And it says they followed Jesus. 
So Jesus turns, sees them following, and says to them, what are you seeking? That's a very pointed question that we might think about as we say, okay, I'm going to follow Jesus. So some of you who are younger, perhaps you rode with your parents to come to church tonight. And maybe you didn't really have a choice. Your parents are too young to stay at home, and your parents said you're coming, and so you came here. So this question is really important for you to answer. It's also important for any of us who drove here on our own volition and said, we're going to come to church. What are you seeking? Why are you here? Why do you come to church? What is the value that you gain by learning about Jesus? It's not just church. It could be other occasions, perhaps as your family gathers together to talk through God's word, as you read stories from God's word, as you talk about spiritual things. What are you seeking? Are you seeking something that will help you uh, progress in this world? If you drive around this area in particular and look at political signs that are popping up all over, we see phrases like a true conservative or God first. There could be a temptation, and I'm not criticizing those phrases, but I'm saying there could be a temptation in our area, in our culture, when there's a lot of popularity with religion, with following Christianity, to use that as a means to gain momentum in the political realm, or perhaps to gain uh, economic value by being able to be hired to a good job because you're someone who goes to church. You're a good person, a nice person. In our area, that's a possibility. But Jesus asks this question, what are you seeking? Why are you following me? And it's interesting to look at the answer that's given. It says, they said to him, rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? This is a little bit, I think, of a sidestep. So the, the, the disciples here of John are saying, where are you staying? Because they want to have a conversation with Jesus, but they want to have a little bit more time to get acquainted with him, to get to know him, to understand who he is before they open the door to more information from him and, and more of a commitment. So they just say, where are you staying? Can, you know, can we follow you to where you're staying? Can we walk along the way with you? Learn a little bit more. But look at what Jesus says. He says to them, come and you will see. He's telling them to come and see where he is going to be staying. Now, this idea of staying is like, where are you going to be for a while? Where are you going to remain for a while? So it wasn't just, uh, let's walk along the road, and then when you go to your place, we'll go to our place, and we won't see each other again. They actually wanted to talk with him for a while, and Jesus invites them. He says, come, and you will see. And so, if you're here tonight, and you don't quite know where you are spiritually, you say, I, I'm kind of interested in, in spiritual things, but I'm not sure yet if I want to commit to Jesus. Jesus offers this invitation. He says, come and see who I am. He wants you to follow him and to learn who he is and to be able to benefit from what he has to offer. Not that there is no sacrifice, but he is open. He wants to have a relationship with you. Some of you, probably many in this room, have committed to Christ and you've trusted in him for salvation. Jesus opens this offer for you to come and learn more and more about him. See who he is on a regular basis as you come and read his word and you listen to it taught or as you read your Bible on a regular basis throughout the week. You can learn more about him. And you may still say, I don't know yet if I want to commit. Well, let's see what Jesus is offering to his disciples. Let's see if this is something that is worth a life of commitment to Christ. So abiding with Jesus involves time in his presence, and Jesus invites those who are seeking him to come and see who he is and what he is offering. But there's a change that happens. As these disciples dwell with Jesus, something changes. So look what happens. It says in the end of verse 39, So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. So this was probably around four o'clock, getting close to the end of the day. One of the two who heard John speak and follow Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, 
which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. So after Andrew had seen who Jesus was, after he realized that he was the Messiah, he brought him to Jesus. When we abide with Jesus, when we stay with him, when we understand who he is, that changes our outlook on the people around us. We will seek to bring others to him. When we understand who Jesus is and what he is offering, we will want others to know about him. We will bring others to him. Back in the early 90s, my grandfather had open heart surgery. And before he went for open heart surgery, he wasn't sure if he was going to make it through the surgical process. And see, so he wrote a letter to each of his grandkids. And I didn't actually get to read it at that time. I think I was only four or five, something like that. But later on, I came across that letter, and I read through it. And one of the things that he said in that letter was that his desire was that I would be like Andrew, the disciple of Jesus, and bring others to Jesus, just like Andrew brought his brother Peter to Jesus. And that was very encouraging to me. And as you think about what is in this passage, we see that that Andrew recognized that Jesus was the Messiah, and that changed something in him. He started to go out and to find others and to encourage them to come to him. And so he goes and gets Peter. And I don't know if you've ever thought much about what the disciples were like, but Andrew knew his brother Peter. He knew that, as we will find out later, and you probably already know, Peter was very outspoken. He was very loud. Once Peter was there, everybody else just sort of faded into the background. And if you were in the spot that Andrew was in, you might think, well, I'd like to continue to get to know Jesus a little bit more before Peter comes in and takes over everything. But that's not what he did. He said, this is the Messiah. I've got to tell my brother about him. It didn't matter to him that he probably wouldn't be remembered very much throughout the rest of history, but Peter would always get the spotlight he was concerned about bringing people to Jesus because Jesus was the Messiah. He was the one who could save them. And as we continue through the passage, we're going to understand none of these disciples understood everything that Jesus was going to do. That's why Jesus taught them for several years and did life with them for several years before he went to the cross. He had a purpose in teaching them. But Andrew understood enough to realize that if Jesus is the Messiah, I must bring people to him. He's the one that can change lives. He's the one that we ought to be following. And then as we look at this verse 42, where Jesus calls Simon, he says, you are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas. Jesus is giving Simon a new name, Peter, the idea of being a rock or something firm, a firm foundation. And later on, we're going to see Jesus instruct Peter to lead particular areas. And, and later on, he leads in the church as it starts out. But Peter's not ready for that. We've seen, as we got to the end of the book of John, that Peter was failing right at the end of Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry to him. And yet, Jesus is going to work in his heart and to change him along the way. And so as we look at this account of these disciples coming to follow Jesus, it should be greatly encouraging to us. We see Andrew changed into one who is ready to tell others about the Messiah. And we see Jesus telling Peter, well, Simon at the time, you are going to become a rock. And it's going to take a really long time. It's going to take a lifetime of getting to know Jesus and understanding who he is and Jesus working in his heart. But Jesus is going to accomplish something in him. And he's giving Peter that hope as he calls him this rock. And so Jesus is very encouraging to those who come to him and to seek after him, even if their intentions are not perfect and if they don't understand all of the reasons that they need a Messiah or they need Jesus. Jesus says, come and you will see. Come and be with me and I will change you. And I hope that gives you hope today, because as you spend time with Jesus, you can be changed, not by your own work, but as you rely on Jesus, as you understand who he is, as you understand his teaching, as you read through scripture, as you talk about him with others 
who have read Scripture and you sharpen each other, you can grow and become the kind of follower of Jesus that Jesus is calling these disciples to be. It's not limited to just these apostles. We can be disciples of Jesus. We can receive the blessing of being able to follow Jesus. I wanted to give you all an update. A few months ago, I told you about the differences between Elizabeth's mode of loading the dishwasher and my own. When, I was, uh, when we first got married, this became very apparent. In my family, we'd always put the dirty dishes in the sink, and uh, then eventually when it got a big enough pile, or you know, as you got to the end of the day and didn't want them remaining for the, for the night, you would rinse them off, very clean, and then put them in the dishwasher for the final layer of sanitation, and then they would be ready to use again. Well, as soon as we got married, I started putting things in the sink, and Elizabeth would look at me, and, and finally she started to explain to me that you don't put dishes in the sink, you put them in the dishwasher, and then the dishwasher actually washes dishes. That's why it's called a dishwasher. Well, it took me a really long time to break that habit. But the update is that over time, I think I've come to recognize, I start to put something dirty in the sink, you know, a spoon with some peanut butter on it or a knife or something like that, and I'm, wait, I can't do that. I need to put it in the dishwasher. And occasionally, if it's, you know, just come out with clean dishes, I can't do that. But for the most part, I'm putting the dishes in there. But something else has changed, too. Now, when I see articles that talk about how powerful dishwashers are, or perhaps an advertisement that says, you know, a dishwasher uses less water than one minute of running water in your sink, I'm like, yes, that's great. I should tell somebody about that. I should encourage other people to just put the dishes straight in the dishwasher. That would be a great idea. Because I have remained with Elizabeth for a long period of time, she has convinced me not only that that's the way that you use a dishwasher, but that I ought to tell others about how you use a dishwasher too, and that many other people can become enlightened as well. In a way, you could say I've become a dishwasher evangelist. Uh, I still would like to keep my job as a pastor, so I don't plan to go out and, and sell dishwashers, uh, but because I've been with her, she has convinced me that this is the way to do it. As you remain with someone for a long period of time, they can convince you over time that that is the right way to do things. Well, if you walk with Jesus, if you follow him and pursue him over a long period of time, then you will grow as he works in your life. He will change you. You might be discouraged and say, I don't see the growth right now. Well, make sure that you're spending time with him. Make sure that you're abiding with him. If you are abiding with him, if you're spending time studying God's word on a regular basis, if you are coming to church and and hearing God's word, and you are singing songs that are directing your attention to the truths of Scripture, and you're interacting with other believers and encouraging one another in God's Word, then over time, you should see that growth. You might not see it in a moment. You might have the same sin that you struggle with for, for many years, but God is working. As you follow Jesus, as you abide with him, he invites you to continue to do that, and change occurs as you follow Jesus. Because Jesus is very powerful. He's more powerful than any person in this world. And if people can influence us by us being with them for a period of time, how much more can Jesus, who rules over all creation, who is God, who came to dwell with us so that we can have a relationship with us, how much more can he change us as we are exposed to his teaching, as we learn what he wants us to learn? So I would encourage you, as we we looked at the very beginning of this year, at studying God's Word. If you don't have a plan to study through Scripture, make a plan. There are plenty available. Use something like the YouVersion Bible app. Download a a version of the Scriptures and, and find a Bible reading plan. You can even have it remind you every day what you ought to be reading. I find that it's really helpful to switch between a a very long, extended Bible reading plan that goes through all of Scripture, and then a more focused study. And so oftentimes, on a quarterly or so basis, I'll take time to go through Scripture kind of like a yearly plan, maybe three chapters or so a day, and then at the end of that quarter, I'll switch and pick a book of the Bible and study that in depth, and then I'll pick it back up the next quarter. And, and maybe you find one method of Bible reading or study a little bit more helpful than another. That's perfectly fine. The time, what, what's really important for us is that we are spending time 
and that we are exposed to both the whole of Scripture and also Scripture in detail at times. And so we need to find ways to do both of those things, and there's many ways to do it. But if you don't have a plan at all, I can tell you, at least from my experience, it won't happen. You need to have a plan to follow so that you are studying through Scripture and exposing yourself to Jesus. And I hope that as you look at a passage like this and you see Jesus calling these disciples to come and see who he is, that you will take that invitation personally. That you will say, I will come and see who Jesus is on a daily basis. Ask him to open up my eyes to see what scripture has for me to learn so that I can grow to be more like Jesus, so that I can be the kind of person that Jesus calls me to be. And I think, as we saw at the end of this section, a good indicator of that is, do you have concern for others? Do you love Jesus so much? Do you, are you excited about Jesus so much that you say, I've got to tell my friends about him. I have to go and tell others. And you might say, I struggle with that, so I just kind of beat myself up about it, and I, I try to remind myself on a regular basis I should be going and telling about Jesus. Well, maybe the issue is a little further upstream. You need to spend time in God's Word so that you see who Jesus is and that you love him and are amazed at him so much that you can't help telling others about him. Maybe that would help you. And as we see from the story here, Andrew, when he saw who Jesus was, when he understood what it meant that he was the Messiah, at least partially, he wanted to go and tell others. That's not to say that you should sit and feel very guilty about not telling others. That's to say, go and spend time with Jesus. And then when you see who he is, you'll want to go and tell others. And, and you'll be remembering to pray about opportunities to share Jesus with others. So Jesus calls his followers to abide with him. So if you're going to follow Jesus tonight, you need to spend time with Jesus. And I'm encouraged to see you here tonight. You're hearing God's word. And that is a way to spend time with Jesus. But, but don't let church be the only opportunity that you take to spend time with Jesus. You need to do it during the week too. Find ways to expose yourself to Jesus and his teaching. And then rejoice as he changes you into the person that you ought to be. But if that's not enough motivation, John continues to encourage us by pointing out the fact that Jesus also rewards his followers. It's not just that we can see that over time he changes us and that we can abide with him, and that's a wonderful opportunity to experience, but there is actually a reward, a blessing that comes from following Jesus. He reveals that he is the promised one. Look at verses 43 through 46. Jesus goes to Galilee, and he finds Philip and says to him, follow me. Here again, he's inviting someone to follow him. And what happens? Well, we have this, this historical and, and geographical note that Philip is from the same city as Andrew and Peter. And, and Philip clearly understands who Jesus is, finds out some information about him. And so he goes to Nathanael and says to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So Philip understands who this man is, and he goes to get someone else to come and follow him. Nathanael says to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says to him, Come and see. Do you see a pattern here? Inviting people to come and see who Jesus is. Now, perhaps as you've read through lists of the 12 disciples, you may say, well, I don't remember seeing Nathaniel show up there. And that's true. Nathaniel doesn't show up in lists of the disciples. We, if you look through the list, most of the other people are there, except there's this man named Bartholomew. And so we don't know 100%, but it's probably very likely that Nathaniel is the same person mentioned as Bartholomew in the other Gospels. And you might say, well, why do they have different names? Well, the idea is that perhaps Bartholomew is another way of referring to him. Bar means son of, and Tholomew could be like his father's name, so it could have been Ptolemaeus or something like that. And that's just another name that he's referred to. Perhaps you have friends where 
you call them something and then you find out that that's not actually their name at all or maybe it's their middle name or you've been calling this, them this name and then you see uh, their, their driver's license or you find out through some sign up that that's not their name at all. Well, that would be a similar case perhaps to what's going on here. Now it's not terribly significant other than to say that there is no error in scripture here. This is an accurate revelation of someone who was a disciple of Jesus, whether he's Bartholomew or not is not terribly significant, but just a note for us to be aware of as we read through this. It's also interesting that all the other people mentioned are mentioned as disciples, so it's pretty likely that this is the same guy. But Philip finds him and tells him this wonderful news. He says, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. So clearly, Nathaniel knows the Old Testament. And he knows the references to the fact that a Messiah is coming. And he knows the the references to where this Messiah would come from. And he is really excited that this man fits the description. Now, as we progress through the book of John, or if you look through the Gospels, you'll see lots of times where the disciples don't quite understand why Jesus is here or what he's coming for. So they may be excited to some extent, thinking that Jesus is coming to overthrow the Romans, to rule over Israel as the rightful king. And, and one day, he will rule as the rightful king. But that's not the time that he's coming for now. He's coming this time to suffer. But in spite of that, these men are excited about following Jesus and learning more about him. And Jesus has revealed this to them. It is clear that Jesus must have, through conversation, pointed out some things to to Philip to make it very clear that he is the Messiah, he's the promised one. Or Philip has had conversations with these other disciples that are standing there. And through that relationship, Jesus calling Philip to follow him, he reveals that he's the promised one. And you might be sitting there thinking, so what? Why does it matter to me if Jesus is the promised one? Well, as we look through Scripture, the very first reference to someone coming to fix the problem of sin is in the book of Genesis. And that's significant for us because in Genesis is when the fall happens. That's when everything becomes broken. And so as you have questions, as you look at the world around you and see brokenness, we see disease, we see people having to go into the hospital, we see shootings, and all kinds of other problems that are part of our broken world. And people ask the question, how can God be good and allow these things to happen? Well, that's a complicated question. But part of the answer for that we find in Scripture. God gave Adam and Eve the ability to choose right and wrong. He didn't force them to choose what was right. And because he allowed them to do that, They eventually chose what was wrong, but he didn't leave it like that. He could have left it like that, and and the world would have just been left in shambles and brokenness and death. But instead, he said, at the same time that he fulfilled his promise that there would be a consequence for their sin, that one day someone would come to crush the serpent's head. And so when, when Philip realizes that this is the promised one, He may not understand in full how the serpent's head is going to be crushed, but it's in Moses, in Genesis, written by Moses, that the serpent's head is going to be crushed. And that means that all of the issues and the brokenness that we see around us will be dealt with eventually. It's in the process of being fixed. God is accomplishing his plan. And so when Jesus reveals that, that is an incredible reward for his followers. And it's not just the moment that you understand that Jesus is going to fix these problems. That doesn't answer every question. That doesn't take the sorrow away from people who have lost loved ones in acts of violence like we see in the news all the time. It doesn't make the pain go away, but it does mean that one day, if we put our faith in Jesus, that we will be with him and that he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. It's not just that there won't be any more crying. It's that the tears will be wiped away. In some way, God is going to deal 
with that sorrow. And that problem is going to be solved. And so when we say that Jesus reveals that he is the promised one, all of your life, as you study scripture, you can learn more about Jesus and more about how he is going to resolve these issues and fix the brokenness around us. And that should give us hope when we receive horrible news about a family member's health or when we struggle with relationships in our lives or any of the difficulties that we face day to day, perhaps those of you who are younger have even struggled this week with your parents telling you to do something and you say, I just don't want to do it. It's so hard to do what they asked me to do. Jesus came to deal with that brokenness, to empower you as you trust in him, to be able to obey and do what is right. And so that's why it matters that Jesus is the promised one, because it changes every part of your life. So he reveals that he's the promised one, and that's good. He's the Messiah, but there's something else. There's something even more wonderful that people in the Old Testament didn't fully understand. When God sent Jesus, he didn't just send a man to fix our problems. He sent himself, because Jesus is God. And so Jesus reveals that he is God, and as Nathanael comes up to him here, we see that so clearly revealed. So Jesus sees Nathanael coming toward him and says of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, clearly Jesus is not saying that Nathanael is perfect or sinless, because we know that Jesus is the only one who is sinless. So this has more of the idea of a phrase we might use, like, this person just says what he thinks. He's honest with you. You can, you can be certain that when he says something, that's what he's actually thinking. But Nathaniel has never met Jesus. And so he's taken aback because he's saying, I didn't say anything yet to help you understand the kind of person I am. He says to him, how do you know me? But it's so clear when Nathaniel comes up to him that that is characteristic of Nathaniel. Everyone knows he's a person that says what he thinks. He's honest with you. Even maybe at times, if you didn't want to hear something, he will clearly tell it to you, what he's thinking. And Jesus says, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So it's clear at that point, there's something that Jesus didn't see, actually physically, but he's aware of, where Philip was, or where Nathaniel was. Now, we might try and figure out, what does that mean? What? Is there significance to the idea of the fig tree? Or is there something that happened under the fig tree that Nathaniel just knows? Okay, that, that instantly means Jesus knows what's going on. We don't know. John didn't tell us. And he doesn't expect us to really know exactly what's going on. But we're just supposed to know very clearly that Nathaniel immediately recognized when Jesus said that, that he was supernatural. He was powerful. And so Nathanael answers him and says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. He's saying, there's something unique about you. You are God. There is no possibility that you cannot be the one who has come to rescue us. Now, when he says something like, you are the King of Israel, we could think of that in a couple of different ways. And he probably doesn't understand that Jesus didn't come right then to reign over Israel and take over and destroy Rome. But when John writes, remember, he often points out things that people say that later on have a lot more meaning. They don't necessarily understand at the time how much significance those words have. But as the story progresses, John, as a very careful and particular writer, picks out things for us to recognize. And so, Nathaniel's speaking this, and at the time, he understood certain things, but John, as the author of the Gospel of John and the Holy Spirit speaking through him, wants us to understand that this is who Jesus is. He is God. He is the King. He is the righteous and perfect King, and the only one who can save. And so Jesus replies to him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Maybe there's some ways that Jesus could have found this out with, without actually using supernatural power. Of course, it's incredible that he knows this, and, and Nathaniel recognizes that, but, but Jesus says to him, you haven't even seen that much yet. I'm going to show you 
so much greater. And if you look ahead, we have one of these signs coming up in chapter 2 of the wedding at Cana that's going to reveal even more who Jesus is. But we remember that John, as he's writing, is revealing to us the purpose is that as we see these things, it's that we would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that we would have life through his name. And so in each of these stories, as we go through this, this book, we should see more and more revealed the fact that Jesus is God. And he rewards his followers by telling them that he is God. And then Jesus follows that up by saying this. It says, And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And you might say, what? What does that mean? What is that talking about? Well, in the Israelite mind, that would immediately jump back to Genesis 28. So let's go back to Genesis 28. There's a few verses there that we're going to look at just briefly to understand a little bit of what's going on here when it talks about the angels ascending and descending. This was a really significant point in Israel's history. This is the time when Jacob receives the promise from God continued from Abraham. In verse 10 of chapter 28, it says, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. We see that same phrase. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I hope as you hear that phrase, you think, Abraham, God made that promise to Abraham. And he's continuing that promise to Jacob. Well, you still are probably wondering, how does that connect to Jesus? What's, what's the connection that he's making here? And I think as John is writing what he's saying is, what, what Jesus is saying here is that this is a clear connection, that this is a significant moment, that they're going to see something as significant as what happened back in that time when Jacob had that promise given to him as the angels ascended and descended from heaven. In that picture, that is the significance, that as all the families of the earth are going to be blessed, this is like pointing from there to hear that this promise is being fulfilled and that these disciples, this is one of the rewards that they're going to have. And not just these disciples, but every follower of Jesus is going to understand the blessing that is coming, that promise back then being fulfilled in the future as Jesus dies on the cross and goes back into heaven, rises from the dead and returns to heaven. That this is the promise being traced through Scripture that God is going to fulfill it in front of them. They're going to see how all the families of the earth will be blessed. And so Jesus says, this is an amazing thing. And again, this is one of those things that over time will be revealed as the disciples learn more about Jesus and understand who he is. But here's the promise. It's coming. There's this great reward if you stick with it. Now, we know that it's not us sticking with Jesus that keeps us following him. It's a dependence on Jesus as Jesus works in our heart. But we are called to follow Jesus. Jesus said to them, come and you will see. Philip tells Nathaniel, come and see who Jesus is. And so I would encourage you as you look at the truths of this passage, this week, come and see who Jesus is. Follow Jesus. Let him work in your heart. Be open to him, revealing himself to you, rewarding you with who he is, and better understanding what he is like and what he calls you to do. It's worth it. The reward is worth it. A few years ago, at the end of 2019, Costco released a message to people who were using Facebook, 
and said, please stop reposting the $75 coupon that is fake that people keep going and clicking on and filling out their personal information and giving it to some random company out there that's not us and then coming into the store and complaining that your $75 coupon is not working. But what's really interesting about that is what people are willing to do to get $75 at a store they like shopping at. They're willing to give away information that probably seems a little fishy, perhaps, so that they can just get a discount. We will do a lot of things just to get a small reward. As you look at what Jesus is offering here, he is offering an incredible reward. He is offering himself. He is offering for us to be a part of his kingdom, a part of his victory in the end, a part of following him and living a life that is fulfilled because we are in a relationship with the one who created us. Wouldn't you say that it's worth spending some time getting to know him? If we'll, we'll fill out a form to get a coupon or perhaps a free sandwich on Facebook, wouldn't we take some time to understand who Jesus is and let that change our life over time? Are we willing to follow Jesus and give up some things that might be good or valuable so that we can pursue who he is? So as you approach this week and you think about your priorities, look at what is most important to you. Are you pursuing Jesus? Are you seeking to follow him? Is he worth spending some time with and abiding with so that you can grow? to get to know him better and to please him? Take some time tonight, tomorrow, to think about how you are following Jesus. It doesn't matter if you are younger, if you're just going into third grade in August and that's why you're in the service tonight, or if you have known Jesus for a long time and you're 80 years old or 90 years old. It doesn't matter. You can continue to follow Jesus all the way until you meet him. And so, if you've trusted in Jesus for salvation, then pursue him, follow him. It's worth it. And if you haven't, look at what he says. Look at what he is offering you, a relationship with him. And accept the gift, the work that he did in your place. You can't pay for your sin. Accept that and trust in him for salvation and start following him and start receiving the rewards that he offers you. And as we continue through the book of John, each of these stories will point us back to the fact that Jesus is God and that we ought to live a life of belief in him and following and pursuing him. So let's pray and ask for God's help to be able to follow him this week. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to this earth and that he willingly came to die on the cross for us, to pay for our sins so that we could be rightly related to you. But he didn't just come and die on the cross. He also called disciples to follow after him and commissioned them. And they have told others. And those other disciples have told others and down through history so that we might receive the gospel, whether it was from a family member or a friend or someone on the, randomly on the street who told us about Jesus. We were able to hear the good news of the gospel, but so often, Lord, we don't pursue you as we ought to. And, and I ask that you would give us the strength this week to make that different, to depend on you, to be able to follow you throughout the week, to get to know you better. And I ask that you would help us to change and grow as we do that so that we can be the kind of people that you want us to be, a salt and light in this world, and that we would be so excited to bring others to Jesus and point them to him. In Christ's name, amen.